Uh, here's one for you folks. Um, I got to remember to save this one. Uh, this is from Inside Crime. Poverty, a recruitment tool for Mexico's criminal gangs. Analysis written by Jeffrey Ramsey. Poverty and lack of opportunity are supplying Mexico's drug trafficking organizations with waves of fresh recruits. However, the government has shown little interest in addressing social issues in its assault on crime. Although many Mexicans have grown somewhat accustomed to reports of violence in the media, some in the country were shocked last month by the capture of six teenage recruits during a June 15th raid on a Zeta's training camp. Especially alarming was the testimony by 16-year-old Maria Celeste Mendoza, who, during one of the Mexico's routine post-arrest press conferences in which the suspects are presented to the media, cheerfully said, I Zetas. I spent two months in training, and I've only been one for three or four days, according to Mexico's El Universal. Celeste and five other adult adolescents who attended the camp, four of whom were women, were paid 12,000 pesos a month, an amount to which is more than three times as much as most Mexicans make in the same period. Officials have arrested a number of these youth assassins in recent months, indicating that this phenomenon is on the rise. In March, a court in Aguas Celentes sentenced a 15-year-old who allegedly worked as a foot soldier for the Gulf Cartel in Quintana Roo, a year in prison. Last December, the country was captivated by the case of El Ponchis, a 14-year-old boy who authorities say is responsible for killing and beheading at least four enemies of the Beltran Leva organization in the state of Morales. The boy's trial began this week in Cuernavaca. A AFP reports that more than 60 witnesses are expected to testify against him in the case. Although there are no official statistics on the number of youths working for Mexico's cartels, the Mexican newspaper Reformer reported in April that officials have charged 214 minors with involvement in organized crime in 2010, up from only eight in 2007. According to data from the Attorney General's office, in total, 1,107 adolescents have been detained by Mexican police in the past six years, and 339 of them were formally accused of belonging to criminal groups. While there are several likely explanations for this phenomenon, most analysts agree that Mexico's abysmal youth unemployment rate is a major contributing factor. As Victor Clark Alfaro, director of the Binational Center for Human Rights in Tijuana, recently told Reuters, organized crime has become a job provider for those in the country with little alternative means of employment. According to Clark Alfaro, since 2000, the age at which people start getting mixed up in organized crime has fallen. In the last few years, the age dropped to about 17 or 18. Recently, Mexico's Assistant Secretary of Education, Rodolfo Truran, claimed that there are an estimated 7.3 million Mexicans between the ages of 12 and 29 who are unemployed and not in school, which amounts to more than 20% of the country's youth population. Despite the fact that these ninis, so labeled because they neither study or work, ni estudian ni trabian, are widely dismissed as simply lazy by many in Mexico, evidence suggests that this trend is due to a serious lack of investment in social programs at the state level. Diana Carbajosa Martinez, a researcher at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico Research Institute on Universities and Education told El Universal that only five states offer social programs specifically targeting this issue. Chihuahua, Baja California, Tlaxcala, Guerrero, and Hidalgo. Meanwhile, the two states with the highest numbers of jobless youths are Chiapas and Michoacan. Where have we heard that name before? And the complete lack of such programs there puts youths Unemployment at more than 25%. Does that sound a lot, uh, not a lot like parts of Chicago? 
As Inside Crime has reported, Mexican President Felipe Calderon has been repeatedly criticized for his security strategy, which many believe prioritizes capturing and killing cartel leaders, known as high-value targets. Instead, these critics who have largely joined under the banner of Mexico's peace movement argue for a more comprehensive approach to Mexico's security crisis, with an emphasis on socioeconomic factors which influence crime. This argument has largely, largely fallen on deaf ears as Calderon and others have pointed out that addressing poverty and inequality will do nothing to impact the illicit narcotics industry, which is estimated to rake in about $40 billion a year. While this may be true, it is difficult to make the case that Calderon's strategy has actually resulted in increased security in the country considering that killings related to organized crimes are up by 16% this year. And that is from Inside Crime, July 20th, 2011. All right, folks, here's another one for good measure. This is, one, this is another one for Samuel Calvin to add to his data. Crime in Mexico. Murder rate reaches record high and nobody is talking about it. This is by Sofia Lotto Percio. People demonstrated against President Enrique Peña Nieto's government in 2015 for its failure to address a struggling economy and security concerns. The highest monthly murder rate on record was registered in May. Newly released figures reveal that one person was murdered every 20 minutes in Mexico in May, the highest monthly murder rate recorded in 20 years. The data released Wednesday documented 2,452 murder investigations in May, almost a third higher than the same time last year and the highest recorded murder rate for any month dating back to 1997 when began, tracking began. Areas that are heavily disputed between rival gang cartels have higher murder rates. In Guerrero State, where the tourist resort of Acapulco is located, there are 260 murders in May, almost seven a day. Guerrero citizens resorted to form vigilante groups to protect their families in the gold mines from rival drug cartels. Guerrero's Unidas and Los Rojos, who fight for control of drug trafficking routes, extort money from the mine owners. In Santa Nola, the home of the cartel led by one of the Mexico's most notorious kingpins, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, there were 184 murders, including the fatal shooting in broad daylight of veteran organized crime journalist Javier Valdez on May 15th. According to regional experts, the capture of El Chapo in January 2016 created a power vacuum that has been violently disputed between different cartels vying for Sinaloa territory. A 2016 report by Human Rights Watch denounced the Mexican military for carrying out extrajudicial extra killings and human rights violations while providing backup to federal police officers in a decade-long fight against cartels. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto is facing modern criticism for his government's inability to address the rising murder rate, according to an International Institute for Strategic Studies, ISSS. Oh, I remember them. Survey on armed conflicts released in May 2017. Mexico is now the second de deadliest conflict zone in the world after Syria. With 22,967 homicide victims in 2016. With 11,155 homicides recorded in the first five months of this year, the final tally for 2017 is set to be even higher. The Mexican government rejected the IISS study findings, claiming that the number of homicide victims is not specific to the drug war, as it includes victims of other crimes such as domestic violence. Mexico State, which recorded the country's highest homicide rate in May with 225 murder probes, has been dubbed the femicide capital uh, by Spanish newspaper El, El Pa. Since the government does not record the number of organized crime related homicides, the overall murder, murder rate is the closest one can get to measuring the intensity of the Mexican conflict, IISS researchers say. Now, what does that say about 
poverty and crime. Well, poverty, crime, crime, and drugs. Where do the soldiers come from? What helps fuel violence? Now, what people want to say is, is that poverty, using a Gini coefficient, you got pe places that are very, very poor. And, or countries that are very, very poor and countries that are very, very rich. Now, the countries that are very, very poor and the countries that are very, very rich, poverty is relative to the two countries. But poverty, like I think it was, was it Jordan Peterson says, even though he says that poverty doesn't cause crime, he also says poverty is rel relative poverty causes crime which is right wing jargon for poverty causes crime, but the only this specific kind of poverty causes crime or murder or whatever. And he says there's absolute poverty and there's relative poverty. All poverty is relative. There's no such thing as absolute power, absolute poverty. If you're hungry and there's no food and everybody else is hungry and no food, everybody's starving. So you're too hungry, too busy trying to get some food together or get cooperation and get some food together and then they go out and, and kill each other. If there's if there's absolute poverty and there's a lot of people, people start eating each other. And there are uh, historical events and documents that prove that people will start eat, eating each other if they can in absolute poverty as Jordan Peterson says, which the violence is even worse. But this specific kind of poverty we're talking about is urban urban poverty. And there's another couple of articles I got to read into the record. I'm not going to do it yet because I got other things to do. That say exactly that. that. And, and those articles are not coming from newspapers. They're actually coming from who? The World Economic Forum. And there is no higher authority than the World Economic Forum. But I will read that later on. But I just want to put this into the record. Because everybody's showing me quantifications and coefficients. And tables that may be data or may not be data. And studies. And not real world on the ground events. And these aren't the only ones. They're all over the world. You got real live on the ground case studies case studies poverty in poor is one of the most studied 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 phenomena in in the, in the human race studied after 2000 years i doubt that some eggheads in the university is going to figure out what people haven't figured out in the last two three or four thousand years i seriously doubt that when it's a human interaction, especially a phenomenon that has been studied, 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 studied closely and still studied to this day. The fact is they know what causes poverty and they know how to prevent it. It's whether they want to spend the money to prevent it or not. That is the difference between right and left or supposedly right and left. It just depends on which right and which left that you're talking about. And at the World Economic Forum, the right and the left come together and they agree on this shit. But anyway, I'm going to jump off of this one. I'm going to put this one up. There may be one coming later. I guess this is, I uh, wouldn't say hater week, but uh, hey, hey, why not hater week? That's, 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 a good enough, um, that's a good enough quote. But anyway, jump off of here. This is BGS Out and I'll see you guys on the next one.